Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so welcome to the uh, Hong Kong Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences. So today, uh, this is our first uh, quantitative history lecture. So, um, as you saw in the announcement, so we have uh, our first uh, speaker uh, come in here with a very uh, unique background uh, to launch this uh, whole series. So uh, Professor uh, Derbin Ma, or Ma Derbin, is uh, visiting us uh, for two weeks. So many of you already know, um, uh, Professor Ma has been uh, very well known for his work on uh, Chinese economic history. Um, he uh, is one of the two co-editors for the Cambridge University Economic History of China. So that just uh, came out last year, is that right? Yeah, okay. So I know he, I know for a fact, uh, he spent a lot of time uh, over, like, uh, over like a two or three year period. So there were many rounds of uh, back and forth revisions and so on, uh, but, but in uh, one of the, uh, to co-editors uh, for this uh, special volume uh, speaks a lot uh, about uh, Durbin's uh, standing in the economic history profession, uh, especially when it concerns uh, Chinese economic history. Uh, so he's currently um, a professor of economic history at uh, Cam oh, no, uh, Cambridge, sorry, uh, Oxford, <laughs> Oxford. <laughs> Oxford University, the better one, okay. Um, <laughs> the older one. <laughs> the older one. Uh, prior to that, uh, before he joined uh, Oxford, uh, he was uh, uh, mostly uh, a professor uh, of economic history at the London School of Economics. And uh, any, anyway, many other, he uh, assumed many other positions in between. Um, so he has published very extensively on various topics related to uh, Chinese economic history, starting with uh, his dissertation on the um, silk, uh, the emergence and development of the Chinese silk uh, industry, uh, as well as uh, textile, uh, uh, going back to the 1920s, especially uh, he did a lot of work uh, contrasting between Japan and China. Um, I really, uh, actually, I first got to know his work uh, be, uh, related to uh, the living standards, uh, the history of living standards in comparative terms uh, among China, Japan, uh, the UK, um, and Holland, and uh, a few other countries. So, so he has been uh, very influential in that area. I guess uh, one thing I want to highlight is that uh, he's one of our core PIs uh, for the uh, AOE project on the quantitative history of China, So, which is why uh, he's here with us uh, for the last two, uh, for two weeks. Okay, so without spending too much more uh, time, uh, let me uh, give the uh, floor to uh, Professor Ma. So let's we welcome her. Huh? Thank you very much. Professor Ma. Thank you. Well, thanks to uh, Zhu Wu or Professor Chen <laughs> for the very kind and generous introduction. Um, I can actually see it's it's not that easy to introduce me, partly because we know we go go, go back such a long way. So it was really a really great honor to uh, to get to know um, Zhu Wu over the years and and uh, doing so much work uh, together or independently on promoting uh, uh, economic history. And of course, you know, uh, as we all know. Um, Zhu has made a huge contribution in in promoting particularly this field. Um, so I really, first of all, you know, use this opportunity very quickly to thank the Hong Kong University Institute and Zhu for inviting me to visit here for uh, two weeks and and especially to best for making the arrangement really uh, very very nice and comfortable, allow me to focus on getting this research done. And it's great after so many years of 
whatever uh, isolation in places to be able to finally get together and to see uh, uh, many of the colleagues here and particularly the visitors that I've got to know elsewhere now finally was able to meet each other uh, in uh, here. Uh, and thanks to many of you who come from outside to, to this building, which is very special. Uh, I think I actually do put down May Hall, Hong Kong University, and it's one of the oldest buildings, right? Um, the least accessible, which makes it a lot nicer for, for concentrating doing my research and so on. Uh, okay, um, I want to say that this is really this has been really good opportunity to give me a chance to push this research, which has been going on maybe even forever to a certain degree. And um, this is uh, first I started co-authoring with Jara Rubin, who's been very patient. And I think I don't know he's probably online um, from the U.S. and and so on. And now we have uh, we one uh, who's joining us, who's uh, who's here. In, uh, coming from University of Macau. So we are really able to use the time we have, not coming up with a with a paper, but coming up with much more comprehensive slides uh, in many ways. Uh, we are very eager for feedback. And I was just talking to Billy, you know, um, I'm a little bit worried that this story, uh, well, he was always very nice to say, oh, this is very exciting. I hope it's it's more exciting than confusing. So we are, I'm looking for ways to sort out some of the confusions. We have a lot of stories. This is multiple paper. I think, you know, the other day, James suggested, uh, you know, I should probably write a small book or we should write a small book on, on this topic. And, and, you know, again, this is a great audience to, and I'm giving the full length of time to talk about it and ideology, which is something we try to pick up and we still try to grapple with. And, um, there are several different kinds of stories about it, and this is highly central to uh, history, economic history, uh, particularly uh, Chinese economic history. Let me just you know, start out with um, a photograph that everybody would know in this context. Uh, what I, we all know, you know this, the whole entire central whatever uh, committee uh, went to visit the museum and look at the entire Chinese history. So what I want to show this is to a way of saying that in economic history, we are very interested in this, you know, we have quite a few scholars here who have made contribution, you know, some of Zhu's work and Jim's work on the historical persistence, right? You know, the things that happened hundreds of years ago, even thousands of years ago, had a persistent today. Uh, what we want to emphasize, that's relevant, but it's even more than that, because in, certainly for China, histo history is ideology. Okay, it's also interpretation. If you look at this history, the way we interpret history is also shaping the actions for present and future. So this is, and, and also the way we interpret history um, is not necessarily the same as the reality of history, right? <laughs> so if there is a reality of history. Uh, so this is what, what we really try to get at, why um, this is particularly important when we compare China and Japan. Um, because it becomes, we need to find a very good, uh, I wouldn't say a natural experiment, but there's something that comes to close. I mean, a natural experiment was only two samples, right? So you can't, that's why it's very much a historical narrative in many ways. One of the things that's really quite striking, as we all know, uh, is the way the history is remembered, right? In the Opium Wars is a national, uh, is a moment of national affiliation, uh, humiliation. Um, which, of course, to a certain degree is true, uh, but it's quite interesting when you visit Japan, you know, the command, the black ship, of course, the experience was quite uh, different. The site where the black ship landed was already, uh, you know, completely disappeared, but they actually dug it up, put a memorial, and this is a really important uh, place in our history, because without that, Japan would be still you know, deep in, in its sleep. With... So they call it, they think of it as a moment of national awakening. And there is that narrative in China as well, but there is also the narrative of humiliation in Japan as well. I think the emphasis, the slight different emphasis is something very, very important that has huge implications for understanding why China, Japan, I will show you, diverged in mid 19th century and why also shaping the way we think about China, Japan today. So this is, this is the example that I want to seize on. And I want to tell you why we, want to return to Japan. So we mentioned that, you know, as you know, I spent quite some time in Japan. Um, 
at the time when Japan was considered the future world, and now uh, it's 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 a nation that declined. So there's a well, I don't want to call it decline, but people are why do you compare with Japan now? Which is actually even more meaningful to compare with. Okay, let me start out with this particular graph, which is it's it's actually hypothetical. So this is illustrating uh, the China Japan divergence. Um, roughly assuming they're starting out as 1850, about the same level. And the Chinese GDP statistics were very scattered. This is per capita GDP and so on. The J J Japanese is much more systematic, although there's always projects revising them, improving them, sometimes improving them, sometimes maybe not. But anyway, um, there is a, you know, that, that's, this is not the time to get into the debate, but the, the trajectory is very, very clear. And the 1930s estimates were very, very solid that Japan has reached uh, a level of income three times that of China. The, this, it's important to remember at the time when Japan launched the war, Japan was still a relatively poor country. It's much poorer than most of the European countries. It's certainly much, much poorer than, than the United States when, when they launched the Pearl Harbor. So this actually is quite reasonable. So you can think about a case where uh, at a time when opium war, roughly at a time, uh, Western imperialism came, these two countries are similar starting points, at least in terms of living standards. Uh, by the way, I, I want to stop. But anybody who wants to have any clarifying questions, please feel free to go. go yeah, maybe we, anyway, otherwise. Okay, so let's start with that. And then we want to go back to that. And as I said, why why Japan, right? This is something that I've been also thinking myself and I did the early Japanese comparison and so on. And um, I want to say, because there's so much work on long-term history of China. Now, one thing that we all know about China is slowly become a unified empire. And the problem was, you can look at historical evolution over time and institutional change, but you don't have a lot of cross-sectional change anymore because the, which I'll talk about later, the Junxian decentralized system has imposed a relative uniform system across the whole, the whole empire. And uh, Japan is quite interesting because we, we want to compare two places, right? If they are completely different, I, I'm not really sure how meaningful comparison that is because you have too many variables that you can't, but you want something that's broadly similar, but is, you have a couple of key factors that are different. So in that sense, this is why we actually latch onto the example uh, of, of Japan. And particularly the historical trajectory is, is very, very interesting, right? They start by copying Japan, being a student of China and turning to become a teacher of China. So this is the process we try to, uh, and this really connects with a lot of the work um, that is, that's been ongoing on. I, I will show some of it. Um, there is a very common way of looking at these things when the country develops. You know, I, I think I'm, we are lucky. I think we, we are able to grow in a reform period. We remember how poor China was and so on. So now, uh, then when China develops, the natural assumption is that it couldn't be that poor. And so it was probably very good. So the, all these what's called revisionist literature trying to say China wasn't that poor, even in the Mao era and all of that. And the similar kind of logic we're going back to apply to Kugawa, Japan, which is the period right before uh, Meiji, is that Japan maybe was already much better in terms of some what they call initial conditions. I will, I will show uh, some of the, and, you know, Japan, Japanese, People, even though they were not rich, but they were better uh, educated. One other thing, which I don't think a lot of people dispute about, comparing Japan and China, oh, they're just culturally more open. You know, the way they absorb Western culture, learning language, and copy institutions, and all of, which is true. Uh, that, of course, went back a long way. Like we all know the famous uh, case of Tang Dynasty that Japan very systematically copied the Chinese, not just the culture, but the imperial political institution, ruling the law system and that was that started at the beginning of the modern uh you know the so the whole concept of nation building was modeled after uh china and all the other things right we will talk about institutions and so on now i want to argue is that all these initial conditions may be true but the differences are really very very minor what really really happened is there is a fundamental switch in the in the paradigm in the mid-19th century. Again, 
people know that the policies have changed dramatically. I think what we try to understand here, why policy could change, right? A lot of people say, oh, just they're more culturally open. They, they're just willing to do that. I think maybe the way the, we are trying to do is a new framework, much more data, is to understand why the Meiji was able to launch a successful regime change, which comes to the question of a revolution, right? Why a revolution came to Japan in a way that is violent, but relatively peaceful, and they had experienced violence afterward, right? The Meiji started in 1868, and it was almost sort of toppled by the Satsuma Rebellion. A lot of people forgot that. You know, there was that very, very, uh, it was really only by 1880s, Meiji Japan began to stabilize and, and move. And then, of course, they, they beat China in 1894, 196. That's something very, very crucial. So this particular project, I, I really want to call it project now, is uh, putting together a new framework, understanding why revolution could have happened, because this is a time which I will show you later, the productivity gap between the West and East was very huge, right? Unlike the 18th century, unlike the 17th century. So there's a very, very simple way of looking at it. All we need to do is quote, quote, copy Western institution. There's no point in reinventing the wheel, right? And this is quite different from the great divergence uh, debate and so on. So this is what we want to emphasize. And it's not just simple copying because on this kind of level, it's a very, very complicated process, right? So we are trying to understand why they were able to, uh, to do that. And in, because it's a rapid ideology change, right? It's just like, I just kept thinking about late 19, 1979, Shanzong Quan Hui, that reform. It was a very big policy switch. Then suddenly opened up all kinds of possibilities which were not possible. You know, it's not all these institutions were so new, uh, but it was that they were there, but they were allowed to begin to absorb them in whatever Chinese way, and in this case, the Japanese way. So this is what we try to understand. And that slowly, I think it's beginning to get interesting because we, you know, as economic, this is the big problem, right? The economic historian will focus on several different small topics and so on. And that's what I start out with. I would spend a lot of time looking at silk, looking at a particular period. I do not know all, all these Tukukawa personalities and so on. But slowly, as, as we were reading through, and I find it's getting more and more interesting that the whole differences could be traced to, much, to a much longer period, and particularly to the way that we interpret history. Okay, so uh, first of all, you know, this is a very long and sort of meandering <laughs> presentation. So let me let me give a structure very, very quickly. I, I think I'm very grateful the other uh, day over over meal with Li Ching and James and others. And so I got some very good feedback with my story. So I got quite excited, and encouraged and, and putting. So I'm, I'm quite looking for the. I, I'm putting together one of the things we have to understand why it happened this way is not just the individual isolated events. It's because precisely because Japan and China interacted. Okay, the the two countries closely interacted. You can see there's a sequence of following, copying, understanding, interpreting events, and both confronted with same Western imperial challenge. So I want to start first a sort of dispute about you know some of the initial conditions argument, Japan was already predisposed, predisposed towards modernization. Japan was already richer, better educated. These things might be there, but the differences were so small. On the other hand, the paradigm shift, the way they were able to get the technological advantage uh, by copying from the West, that was huge. I will give you some example of the mechanized uh, yarn output. Okay. To be able to get the fruits of particularly British Industrial Revolution, that was the key in certainly mid 19th century. And then I really want to show you that the modern China, Japan, the intellectual origin, most people reading from Japanese perspective or from Western perspective, but if you read from Chinese perspective, it's particularly interesting. The modern Japan had its Chinese intellectual roots for, for understandable reason, because after all, they absorbed the Chinese, everybody read, you know, Kangbong, the Haven materials and so on. So we want to show you that it was the China was the origin of modern Japan, and the other way around, modern Japan was the origin of modern China. And it was that mutual interaction that uh, that really led to, and we want to talk about why the reforms uh, become somewhat less successful. So I'm, I'm going to um, go through this relatively quickly. Again, let me know if you have any 
questions or if I said something wrong, but okay. Um, this is a, what I would call quite typical of this initial condition school. If Japan did so much better in Meiji, then Tokugawa could not be so, uh, so bad. And it must be a lot better than Qing China. So this is, uh, you know, these are my friends and colleagues who made an argument. I was also in Hidotsubashi. You know, this is the estimates by uh, Jean, Bas Jean Pascal Bassino and Steve Robbery and Kyoji Fukao. And um, I think I've been, I've been quietly and very friendly disagreeing with them for a long time. <laughs> um, they have this argument that Japanese per capita income was already higher. I want to argue the evidences are very, very weak. Uh, because partly because the data was not particularly good. There's a separate set of argument by uh, Chiaki, again, my colleague at uh, Hitotsubashi, former colleague, and, and Duan Wei and, and Mark Kuyama argument that to grow our fiscal capacity was much higher. And I, you know, I will show that was not, not really the case. I have evidence showing the Japanese per capita income was not high at all. I mean, if you really read the literature of time, so this is the data we've done in the way, for the wages until the end of the 19th century, Japanese per capita income is about the same as China. It was only after they began to overtook China. Okay. I mean, one of the most striking evidences, even for people living in modern Japan, I was surprised I didn't realize that. Uh, but in the colonial period, Japanese, in the way, yeah, I think Du was presenting the paper that uh, Japanese heights were, Japan were the shortest people probably uh, in the mid 19th century in, in Asia. In the, the average heights, this is soldiers is 157 or something, but they grow continuously. Okay. So it's really hard to argue physical living stance was, was any higher. Of course, there's social institution and those things we talk about. Okay. So I made some efforts in this, you know, maybe this could be a separate paper we'll be talking about. The idea that Tokugawa has very strong fiscal capacity that was very, very, um, that's probably implausible. Uh, and it, it, this comes back to the whole state capacity literature, which is very, very tricky. If you really look at data, I will show you that Tokugawa Japan has a very, very different system. We all know early Meiji was completely fiscally strapped. I, be, I began to really see the biggest wind free fall windfall for Japan is the, is the fiscal extraction they got from China after the Sino-Japanese War. They got 200 million silver tail. And that's when they move into the gold standard. And that really helped uh, uh, to some degree solve the, the fiscal problem. I mean, the tax rates for Tokugawa were so high, it was implausible. It's higher than Meiji. It's higher than, it's about the same level as modern, you know, 19th century Britain, which is considered the first modern fiscal state, right? So there, I think there is an element of um, glorifying the Tokugawa system, which uh, I'm trying also to, I, I think I'm, some of the people will be happy here too. Will be. There, there's that California school is also a bit of a glorifying the Qing China because China was developing and so on. So there's a similar way of, this is why history is never completely objective. So this is what I try to argue that it's, it's really not clear that the fiscal capacity was stronger. Actually, I want to argue that precisely because Tokugawa Japan was very poor, it, it's, it doesn't have to be a hindrance, okay? And it's the policy switch that was very, very important, that it's possible to have this kind of great, great discontinuity, okay? So this is all the policy change that have happened. You can see Tokugawa Japan today, which I will go into is what we call feudal society. Feng Jian is the... It's not the, for those of you who come from mainland China that, you know, uh, there's big debate. That, well, maybe it's not debate within China. But anyway, China wasn't really feudal. Uh, we probably, probably after the Qing, China was no longer feudal society uh, anymore. But Tokugawa Japan was a feudal society. And in the sense that you have these lords, you have, you know, all of these. So you can see all these policies are opening up uh, the reform, the financial system, the banking system, and all of that. Okay, there's a very, very big policy switch. Uh, some have already started in the Tukura, but really started. And look at these, also the land sales, right? So in the feudal system in Japan, labor, a land actually is much more restricted. I and mean, this is something I'll get back to. So in some sense, China was much freer in terms of the factor markets. Um, because you have one emperor, you don't have feudal lords, so which is something we'll come back to a little bit. So some of the Meiji reform is 
as I will show later, is, is sonification, is converging towards the West, but actually to, converging towards the Chinese model. What I want to show you is that there's a very big lag between in the reform and adopting Western institutions. There's probably a two decade lag. China did right after Japan. So all of these things probably on the left hand side, I'm not saying you have to do all of these. I'm not saying all of them will work in China, Japan, but in the mid 19th century, what, presented, what was presented to, to East Asia is this menu of possibility, institutional possibility, which were not there before, right? So these things, maybe you all have some, these are only just an example, universities, uh, you know, even something like double entry bookkeeping and so on. Japan was at a pioneer, you know, on, on everything. And so that gives the idea that Japan was culturally more open, but I don't mean to be offending any Japanese, but, but anyway, if you live in Japan, it, it, you wouldn't consider that was a very culturally open place, right? It's a very modern society and so on. I think Hong Kong is probably far more open in terms of uh, or internationalization. And so it's not so much the cultural attitudes that it's actually something else. And I want to argue that policy change could lead to cultural change as well. And, you know, they really pioneered. Uh, so this is what we tried to, China really fall behind for two decades. And also why two decades later, they, as if China kind of woke up, right? So this is why what we try to say that this, they're waking up because, uh, there's something that was going on. Okay. Um, again, this is, you know, it's, we're talking about Cambridge Economic History uh, volume where both, I think, James and Zhu have contributed chapters in a separate volume. So I'm, I think I'm stealing some of the stuff from uh, James's chapter, which, which I was still a lot of. So you can see these are a number of more, more firms, modern firms in, in China. Nothing happened before 1890. It was only after they were defeated by Japan. Ban, they were just shooting up. You know, and the, the, you know there are a lot of other examples. University is the same. Um, I, I just found that Hong Kong was only established in 1911, right? And uh, there was a recent exhibition of Tsinghua University, which was also set up in 1911, and that's around the time the Beijing University, uh, even Yanjing University, which is a Christian missionary university, set up in 1910. So, so all the university was set up at the time, it, apart from some. You know, the St. John's University in Shanghai, which no longer existed, was set up much earlier. But those are really Western uh, universities and so on. But if you think about, whereas if you think about the Tokyo, the four imperial universities in Japan, they were set up in the 1870s, 1880s. Okay. And, um, you know, I think I was visiting years ago, I was visiting University of Tokyo, walking around the campus. I was very struck by, they have lots of statues of the scholars who founded the Department of Biology, Department of Chemistry, all of these people are German and, and, and French. They set up a statue for them. So th they paid a lot of money to get these people set up the departments. And then, you know, it's time for you to leave uh, once the department, some of them actually stayed. And, and so they, they really very consciously copied that particular uh, um, model. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm actually laboring that a little bit because this is quite important in the literature. The, the, one of the things, again, working with Win Win is looking at a cotton yarn. So one thing I want to machine spun yarn, you know, the spinning jenny, all kinds of things. These are really the, the core of the British Industrial Revolution. Any country that successfully uh, modernized based on uh, mechanization will succeed. And there's no particular reason why you can't, cannot adopt them, certainly between Japan and China. But look at Japan adopted way, way earlier. China really only started that. I mean, there was a very well-known story. Li Hongzhang took the machines. They had the machines, but they let them sit there for 10 years, I think 1880s. And so that was a famous, quite well-known in the history. It was only after. But look, once China adopted, that's the critical thing, right? So it's not so much about not being able to produce or entrepreneurship or, or even capital. Once they started, Look at this, this trajectory. I mean, it's shooting up very, very quickly. China was becoming a very large uh, cotton producers. And many of them, as we probably know, produced the first generation of industrial capitalists, the Rong family, and to some degree, Liu Hongzheng and all those people, right? And, and of course, Japanese massively invested in, uh, in China as well. And bear in mind, I mean, this is a little bit later, the productivity difference is 40 times. So from 
neoclassical perspective, why in the world you do not want to do that, right? And of course, you would destroy your hand spinning industry and all of the things. And there's vested interest, there's all those capital requirements, those things were, were there. But anyway, so I think I want to really make a point. Anybody who's got a hold on this technology is going to win. And that's what China didn't do. So it's not a question about, I think when I was talking to Chiaki, it's not a question about whether or not China was able or not able to do. If they just didn't do it, right? Until here. Yeah. So we want to ask the question, why they didn't do it? And why Japan did it? And by the way, Japan was very much a, a, a anomaly. Most countries outside Western Europe do not do it, right? So this is, um, we, you know, dudes here, we, I need to learn a lot more about Korea. Korea was even more dead set against the whole uh, system, which is a semi-independent sort of a tributary state. Okay. So I'm not going to go into the silk industry is another example. I, you know, again, you see the Chinese catch up later on. Okay. So, um, so that's the, I really want to make a case for the policy change. Okay. Because this is something, I think the reason we don't do it very well, because we, we actually didn't very carefully look at the importance of ideology. We got stuck either with culture or institutions. And when we have a missing link of ideology, that becomes quite important. How does a country switch to ideology opening? Okay. Um, so let me sort of get to the, uh, the, the first part of it, which is the Chinese origin of modern Japan. Um, so why did, you know, there is a beginning, when I meant the institution of variation, right? Uh, I think I was, you know, talking earlier. One of the great things about some of the great historians, particularly I'm going to draw on the work of Ge Zhaoguang from Fudan University, and even Qing Hui, they were beginning to pay a lot of attention to the case of Japan. I mean, for all kinds of reasons, which I will show you later on. But one of the things is that there's a particular institutional variation of Japan that made a very big difference, which I'm going to argue here. So it's not even the culture itself, the culture that actually they you you know they adopt same they read the same Chinese poetry of course they had some the even the their own traditional culture had connection with Chinese scholars as well. I may be making a very very strong argument. So let me highlight this very very quickly. In the case of China, we all know the Confucianism, we not all know the legalist scholar Fa Jia and so on. But I think that the the story is quite clear. The Qing unified China, there's reversals and so on, but eventually it's the Fajia school that really dominated. The crucial institution is the Junxianzi, right? Is the elimination of aristocracy. So that, there's a back and forth of that. But this is something very important with civil service examination and, and, and the bureaucracy. Now, and in China, they would say, you know, the Confucius is, um, is on the outside, is, is a cloak of legitimacy, but the real policy is legalist. The legalist is about punishment, it's about control, right? And, and all these things. To make my argument very, very uh, simple is Japan adopted the Chinese imperial system, uh, ended up not adopting some of the crucial institution or not being able to, which turned out to be a blessing. The crucial system is the civil service examination. The country custom. In that case, they never had a nationwide bureaucracy. Right? So what Japan did was something quite peculiar. And of course, they, they consider that's relatively backward. They, they're not able to adopt the advanced Chinese institution, is they adopted the original Confu the feudalism, which is prevailed at the time of Confucius. Remember, Confucius ideology was in the Eastern Zhou period, Dongzhou. And that was the time where you have very strong kings and you have a nominal emperor, okay? And you do not have a nationwide bureaucracy. So in that sense, you could say that Japan was a truly a Confucius society, that that was the argument we try to make, is by Tokugawa Japan, they never got evolution uh, towards the Chinese. The whole, you probably heard of the Tangsun transition. So Japan missed all the Tangsun transition. The thing about Tangsun transition is the rise of the emperor, right? So we have a lot of works, I think Zhu and Ling Zhan, showing that the emperor become much more stable and bureaucrats were more likely to be purged after the Song transition. The Song emperor was becoming stronger, which I will show you later. One of the things that Song centralized is they got rid of the Fan, Fan Zhen. 
exactly the fund system, right? Because fund was these independent fiscal military units that were pose threat to the emperor. Okay, so that was the crux of the argument that we will have. Uh, why did China got rid of the uh, the Feng Jianzi? That was very very clear because the Feng, the feudal system was inherently unstable politically. The emperor was constantly at risk. In the feudal system, there are a couple of things which I'll summarize, particularly because on one's point is that there's a very strong aristocratic power, okay? And the emperor power was relatively weak. Everything else was the same, okay? It's not, this is not Western feudalism, which I will, um, and it was particularly good at crushing rebellion, which you will see when I take to the mid 19th century, why Tokugawa Japan was politically so unstable that it gave rise to Meiji reform much more easily than in the case of China, okay? So this is a story, uh, we want to sort of argue is that <clears throat> this very peculiar case of Japan stuck in the old uh, mode of uh, feudalism uh, ended up helping them, um, which we want to argue. I think this is something I want to argue. Well, this is the this is, the, I think, the three things that were summarized by Ge uh, is a you know, recent three-part paper. And where he called the structural differences between China and Japan. Okay. And I think it was very good to, you know, Ge uh, is an intellectual historian on China. So, and he spent quite, you know, he spent a year of uh, isolation in COVID in Japan, so which allowed him to absorb all the Japanese literature. And he's his paper is uh, very well cited with Japanese sources and so on. And the main thing he summarized, if you think about at a time in the, in the 19th, 18th century, the, the Japanese emperor was what's called Xu Jun, the nominal emperor. They were based in Kyoto and in, in Tokyo, we know it was the Tokugawa Shogun, Shogun Zhu Xiangjun. I think I was talking to Kai Xiang, you know, the Shogun system, we, you know, Cao Cao is such a figure, right? So they, they had all the old things about basically a military general, you know, using the legitimacy of emperor to rule. But the emperor um, himself is becoming a nominal figure, which also means in Japan, the aristocracy was much stronger. So in Japan, you still have very strong aristocracy, several different big family, Tokugawa being one of them, right? So this is something that's very, and this is very, very important. They maintain the Feng Jianzi. So we will show about 200 some funds, the, the funds and the fund, and they remained relatively independent. Even in the fund, there are different classifications. It's these classifications that proved to be fatal to the Tokugawa regime, okay? That they just overthrow them very quickly. I mean, the last point, I don't think I want to, you know, he was also religion was much stronger in Japan, but it was mostly Buddhism, but I'm, I'm not really, but this is, I, I want to emphasize is all of these elements make Japan sound a little bit more like the West, which Japanese uh, scholars in, you know, 19th century, when he went to Germany, said, oh my God, Japan is much more like the West than China uh, is, which is true. But remember, it, it is Chinese feudalism, it's not Western feudalism. And there's something crucial that was missing that was very important for the rise of capitalism is free cities, the idea of corporations uh, rep represented a government that was ne never really there. So to go and say Japan will evolve towards capitalism by itself, I think that would be very, very tricky. What I want to argue is actually building on that. It could not evolve on self, but it created conditions that will lead to regime change if the regime change is accompanied by ideological change. And that's precisely what happened. And China was much more difficult. Okay. So I will show you, we, you know, so this is the a map, which I will come back again, again. This is the Chinese map, which, you know, 18 provinces is direct administration, the county level. Okay. They were sent directly by the imperial system, right? You have the entire, um, all these people are directly appointing uh, the county magistrates and, and so on. In Japan, you have these different, you have Tokugawa, which is white, and you have three different types of fund, which I will talk about. Uh, we will use that information quite a lot. Uh, the Tozama fund is the most important. I will see the kanji, wai yang, wai min wai, yang zi yang. Those are the larger funds, mostly in the Southwest. Um, so, you can see the Japanese way control is very similar to Zhou system, which was not sustained. I think in Japan sustained because they never had nomadic threat. 
They never had a such, you know, it was very isolated. Um, so those are the finds, the Todama are the finds that Tokugawa did not trust because they were on the other side of the warring faction in the 17th century when Tokugawa win the war. And what they did is they put them outside. And the ones that are close to them are what's called the Xingfan, Xingpan and Pu Dai. Xingfan is the Qing, is the Qing, Qing the Qing. So those are some collected by blood. So, you, you know, you can think about a feudal system of control, right? I, I'm the Zhou uh, emperor. I have various these kings. Some are closer to me. Some are my relatives. Some are uh, people that, you know, swear allegiance to me, but I'm, I don't really trust them. But if they are far away, that's fine. Or if I have other people controlling them, that is a system of control. So the Tozama, which I will show you, all the revolutions, the major revolution were launched by the Tozamas. Okay. It was a change of regime in that regard. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, let me not go through the model, or let me at least just show the pictures and so on. So we, we were doing, we, we tried to in some way uh, model ideology and define ideology. But what I want to show, uh, just a very simple graph, basically showing um, on the horizontal axis is the cultural, uh, is the external threat. Both Japan were and China were faced with external threat from the imperial. And there's the cultural distance. Uh, Places with closer cultural distance tended to adopt the ideology. For example, you know, Americans even winning independence, they adopted the British Industrial Revolution very naturally. There's no particular barrier to that kind of uh, probably language and all these things. That even you know, notor notorious island began to industrialize. Right? They share the same common language, uh, even though religiously they're quite different. So a lot of people don't realize such anomaly for Japan, which is farthest away in culture, in linguistic, in all of that. It was very isolated. That became the first country non-Western to industrialize. And that's no small you know, feat. I mean, how would anyone even think it's possible, right? So what we are showing here is, I mean, the difference is, this is China, <clears throat> and they're culturally far removed, and they're facing the threat, but they're not. This is they're not likely to adopt the Western ideology. We, in the model, we show adopting Western ideology is very risky to the legitimacy, to all kinds of things, right? So you stay with the status quo. The only difference with Japan is that because the daimyos were independent, so each of these daimyos began to experiment to a certain degree, okay? In China, that kind of experimentation was not possible because the provinces were completely controlled, okay? So this is what we try to argue. And this is Tokugawa. So Tokugawa wouldn't, you know, wouldn't. And then over time, you can see the daimyos' ideas were beginning to change. There's consultation that was happening 1860s, people are more pushed towards open. I mean, we were talking about the most ironic part is the daimyos that really ruled Japan, they were actually the most conservative, most radical anti-foreign forces. And, uh, and and they actually went on, attacked Western, first Western missionaries. So they were like the Ihotan, right? They, those people just, they saw anybody Western, they went, these are samurais with these very big, you know, with very sharp, knives or swords, should we call swords. And they go and kill these Western missionaries randomly. And those are the people who actually carry out a major reform. And that's, uh, and of course, I think when, when I was talking to my job, yeah, those people were, they were, they, they were really quite smart. They know what it, what's going on. They want to embarrass the Tokugawa government. So it's, it's the kind of extreme radical position they took. Okay. But whatever it is, I think the thing we want to really emphasize is so by the time of 1860s, some of the daimyos began to move around, the coalitions began to change, and they were able to push Japan across the, the in, in, entire land. And China was stuck in the old place of not adopting policies. So it's not like they don't understand the threat. I did, you know, knowledge they, they do, and I will show you some of the examples they actually really do. Okay. And that, of course, the picture of that becomes quite interesting is by 1895, when Japan defeated China, that became a huge push for the Chinese psyche. That's when all the 100-day reform, the late Qing constitution reform came. And those reforms were modeled very, very closely after Japan. So to talk about initial conditions or culture, all these things in isolation is not very meaningful. These, the things these two places interacted very, very closely. Okay. So uh, anyway, I guess everybody's following me, right? Nobody asked. 
Um, so let me let, let me show you some of the empirical work, with, especially with what we now is trying to do, is what we try to see the mechanism that leading to the rise of major Japan and, and different kinds of rules and how the elite structure was, was very, very different. Okay, first of all, the, the fact that Japan remained feudal was recognized by uh, someone may not know him very well, but in, in people in the intellectual Zhu Sensui, who is uh, a scholar, was born coming out of the same area as Gu Yanwu and Huang Zhongxi. So those people are, are very, very worried about late Ming, but they are late Ming loyalists. Okay, they were actually very crucial, uh, at least according to some scholar, to, to the connection of Japanese national consciousness with the Japan's Guo Xue and Gu Xue. And also particularly we we'll talk about the Mido school, which is a, a Qing Fan, but that was very, very close aligned to Gu Gua family. It was the Mido school and the Tozama. They got together and got into a very nasty fight with the Tokugawa <coughs> Bakufu. There are two people in particular that are very crucial. I, I think I'm pronouncing the Chinese name, Zhuozhou, and he was one of the people. And, and uh, showing, especially uh, Yoshida. Um, I, the reason I want to raise both of these people is both of the people were heavily influenced by Wei Yuan. And their first knowledge of the Western imperial is coming from Wei Yan. So their work cited Wei Yan very extensively. Wei Yan's Hai Guotuzi. I mean, Hai Guotuzi was basically coming from Lin Zexu, right? Who were defeated by, by the uh, by the West. So Lin Zexu was one of the people who actually didn't know much about the West, but but eventually observed firsthand the power of the Western military and, and other things. That's you know we and Japan knew very little, but the Haigudus had a very big impact in Japan, not that much in China. Later on, of course, it became very, very important. Okay. So this is a sort of so I want so we want to build we are still in the process of building a a network analysis like the type that uh buying and jiao were doing for the uh for the uh Zimko fund. So one of the Tozama, the biggest is the Changzhou Choshu Fan. That's the major anti Bakufu rebellion. Uh, <clears throat> Yoshida, who is a student of the Zhuozhou, and who actually ended up setting up a school in Choshu Fan, which is, again, I want to emphasize independent autonomous, right? And among his students, many of them, we have a whole list of them become major uh, anti-Bakufa people. So you can see Eton Boven, right? And you can see Kito, who is, who is later the prime minister. So those are the people who went to his school. That was all the connections that's coming out of it. There's more, and you can see that, um, so those, and eventually I think Yoshida was, 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 was executed by the Bakufu, which triggered the entire samurai assassination of the Lao Zhong, the Lord, the, the Tukurao, and that really weakened the power. That kind of kicked off the whole anti-Bakufa uh, movement. I mean, Yoshida himself is not, you know, well, he had this crazy idea of uh, running to the West, and then he was captured for that reason. Uh, you know, he was trying to, because they were not allowed to travel overseas. He, he actually left the Chukchu, which was also illegal. So at that time, you know, you, you can't leave your Han uh, legally. And he, so he has done all kinds of illegal things and then he died very young, but that particular Juku, the, the school became the uh, place of instigation of the ideas. And they eventually aligned with the Mido school and to Mido school provided the most important intellectual source of rebellion against Bakufu, which was surprising. The Mido school is actually as a loyalist, a radical nationalist, where they were arguing that Bakufu was not loyal to the emperor. That the Tokugawa was not anti-Western enough. That was the argument. The Zheng Wang Rang Yi, the, this is also exactly Japanese phrase used. So all right, it was a Zhou dynasty kind of phrase, right? So what the Meiji did is basically we want to oversue the Bakufu. We want to have the real emperor back we want to have centralization. That all sounded extremely familiar in the Chinese context, right? Except at that time, the Western ideology really came in. So this is something that's very important. Afterward, they switched. That's a different story. So those are, you know, the whole story is like Nixon can go to China, right? He's the most anti-China person. He visited China. So that actually solves the problem. So you have a similar kind of a story here that you have these most radical nationalists 
And there's a, you know, there's a story of these radical nationalists because Choshu and Satsuma, the two major Tozama Hans, Hans, are very radical. They are the ones that launched naval attack with whatever they have on the Western uh, naval forces by themselves. And they were defeated very, very badly. And, and that's when they began to, you know, like the Opium War, began to realize the Western power. So they go from being defeated to being an admirer of the Western uh, system. So they allied with the British Navy and so on. Okay, so this is the thing. So we are able to, so these are the Japanese feudal institution. They use a unit, which I think in Japanese is kokudaka and is, is tanko. So these are the typical feudal, each feudal domain was defined by a rice unit and that's hereditary. And this is something you do not have in, in China, right? Because China, everything is county, province, prefecture. Okay, in Japan, you have the Tukuga, which is centralized. But uh, so you have these units there. So one of the things that's very important, the Tozama, the variation is very, very big, which is there are some of the Tozama Hans are very large, the biggest of the Choshu and, and, and the Satsuma. It's these, they are also on the southwestern coast. So they're much more exposed to the Western threat. And they're really sizable. If you look at the, the total size of it. So this is a formidable rivalry between these forces, which you was completely disappeared, certainly in the time of the Qing. And I think that's thing we want to emphasize, I mean, for those who read the kanji is very, you know, the Satsuma and the Samo and Changzhou, those are the most anti-Western, they, they also send students. So those are, they also have some of the most enlightened individuals as well. I mean, the Baku sent out the largest number of students. They're all Todama fund. They send, so these are things they did independently as, as these feudal places. And we will show later on, um, I think, Gao San Jing, so he's, he's actually the most interesting. He didn't get to live to see the success of the Meiji restoration. He was somebody who visited Shanghai when Shanghai was becoming a treaty port. I was completely stunned by the Western establishment in Shanghai. That was the first impression that I really taught him about something. But the second thing he was stunned, remember these people are all trained in classical Chinese scholarship, right? They read Chinese very well. They said, I can't believe the Chinese status was so low in Shanghai. <laughs> so Japan needed to do everything to get out of this whole imperialism threat. And he became a major rebellion. He organized the troops and, and all of that to go against the, um, and it was even funny, he actually went against the Choshu. So they, he launched the internal coup d'etat within the Choshu Han, and the Choshu Han became very radical against the uh, uh, Tokuga. So, you, you know, you have a very good cases of these low level, and uh, these people are low level samurais. They are not, you know, they're not even upper class people and so on. And he, you know, unfortunately he died very young, so he never get to see the, I think the Wei Xing Sanji, there are three prominent people. Uh, so these are the, the overseas students, so this is a map. We go back and all the ones that were red were anti-Bakufu. The ones that are yellow, that are pro-Bakufu, right? So these are the two factions. You can see the, the most prominent is the Samo and Changzhou, and, and that they were the constant rivalries. And so this is the kind of structure that you really, really, uh, <coughs> the Fu, which is the Mito school. And it's a very small, uh, but it was very, you know, it was a relative of Tokugawa, but they somehow got very upset. It was, a, it was an internal fight between the relatives. So they got really got aligned with the, but they provided intellectual input. So Fu Huan is the one that had a very close connection with Zhu Sensui a long time ago. So here's some of the empirical tests that we are able to do. So we, um, again, you know, thanks to our uh, Wei Wen who's here. So we are able to match all the red, the, who are the Meiji supporters? Or, or anti baku who are the, the ones that are green, and with the different types of uh, Han, the Tokugawa, the, the Hans. And you can see very, very clearly that if you are Tozama, you're more likely to be a major supporter or anti baku people, okay? So the, this differentiation made a very, very big difference. And this is what we want to say, the feudal domains made a very different. And, you know, this is the confirmed by, uh, by the Loja test and all the other tests that we have done. I mean, it's probably quite clear uh, visibly uh, the Tozama coefficient come out to be very, very significant. So being, uh, um, you know, we control for a couple of other things and distance to Tokyo and so on. 
Okay. Uh, this is, if you're Todama, you're more likely to be anti-shogunate, anti apocryphal right? Uh, you are, you know, are you, so you're less likely to be neutral. And if, the other way around, if you are the Pudai, you are much more likely to be pro. Uh, so this is really two internal fractions in a feudal uh, system, which is very common, right? So that's why China eliminated them, because the feudalism has destroyed Daito. <laughs> and and uh, in, in Japan, it was that was not the case. So you can see this is all the anti-Bakufu. This is their... Uh, this is probably the fiscal strength. It's really, really quite sizable, right? So this shogun itself is about 3,000 whatever uh, kokudaka. And the uh, anti-bakufu is all elements together, particularly satsuma. And, uh, um, and the choshu. I mean, the satsuma major is the xixiang rong. So I think you, if you watch the last samurai movie by uh, Tom Cruise, the Hollywood movie, and that was portraying Xixiang. And, you know, he was the major old-fashioned samurai. Uh, you know, he launched the whole thing against the... Okay, so we can also match this very, very clear with the first Meiji government cabinet ministers. They're all from Tozama, that's very clear. So this is basically a takeover, uh, you know, one faction over another. There's Gongqing, these are the royal imperial family. So this was consistent with some of the description about Meiji Japan is a coalition between the royal, a small minor royal elites and the lower class samurais. Okay. These lower class samurais are the ones who try to assassinate Christian mission, missionaries, launch war. In, uh, the, the, the point I was trying to make is they are the ones, they are not liberal Democrats, right? They don't believe in, you know, they have no idea of free market and all of that, right? But what they, what they saw is the gun power. But then they seized the power. And they were able to really recognize it. In China, you don't have that recognition. That's something that is very... Uh... So anyway, let me, um, you know, in the remaining time, going back to look at the... the... So in, this is the intellectual change that really happened. We all know that very well. Um, there is a Meiji slogan is they use Junxianzi, right? Today, in, in, you know, when you go to Japan, you hear this gen, just xian. So they use the Junxian system, of course, is much more, you know, is democratic elected and all of that, right? So that's a different story. But it was a centralized system. And it, that was coming from the court. They, they actually abolished the Han. So all these people handed it back. How did it make convinced to hand back? We have the, you know, we have the Meiji emperor. And we have the whole legitimacy. Now the country needs to be unified as one to go against the external enemy, which is a very, very familiar slogan in Chinese history as well. That's the reason for the... So some of the, I think... Uh, Guan's paper, he was talking, he said, oh, I started this paper talking with a Japanese political scientist. He said, did you realize that Meiji is actually signification, is, is catching up with China? It, it's not completely, but clearly the Western system that really coming into it. So let me, let me go very quickly to the, maybe another five minutes or so, uh, turning to the case of China, which is quite interesting. I think the point I was trying to make is very, very clear. In the case of China, it's not like there's no culturally open people. There are some people, actually the Chinese degree of openness is probably far greater than Japan because the Chinese in Kanto, although I think there is a very nice little popular history book by Mark Wuchuan, which probably inspired me reading about major history. The, the, the people who, when, when the Japanese and, and the Americans negotiated a commercial treaty, I think in the 1850s or so on, the man who translated was a Cantonese merchant. And, and he had no idea about what was going on. But the only reason he was asked, because he knows English. And, and then, of course, he could communicate with Japanese using pens, because they all write characters you know, at that time. And then he completely disappeared. Nobody remembered him. So the, the, the you know, yeah, there's the Dutch study, Lankaku and all of that. But the Japanese uh, ability to speak foreign language is very, very limited. There's no particular reason that Japan was much more culturally open. There is a very big difference is the provincial system. And Lin Zhexu is a Qing Ta Da Tun, right? Is one of these people sent by emperor to suppress a local rebellion, right? Now there is one incidence that local forces began to rise that that makes a particularly interesting contrast that it happened around the same time when the Meiji was going on, the anti-Baku movement going on. 
which is the Taiping Rebellion, right? So we all know Taiping Rebellion was suppressed by the Hunan elites. That makes this story extremely interesting in the sense that for the first time, you have a place where there is a group of elites that had a fiscal military autonomy because they raised the troops from the lineage. So this is, and they raised the money partly through leeching taxes, and, but all, all the other ones, leeching tax was a form of local tax, taxation. So you can see that Taiping Rebellion was creating the kind of local autonomy that you see that Hunan was becoming, or Hunan Zhang, becoming increasingly independent because the, the emperor couldn't suppress, couldn't do anything, right? So the most, most famous character, of course, is Zheng Guofan. And, and the other, you know, Li Hongzhang was, well, there's a slightly different story. I think, Li, but I, I think I don't, so I think this is, I'm taking, cutting out from uh, buying a Jaratius paper that for the next, you know, three decades, we see the rise of Hunan elites. Now, this is based on one critical condition, is I think the Xiangjun, the Hunan army, by the time, which is a very modern army, right? They use all the weapons and all, all the things. And they were eventually defeated the Taiping rebels, which the Qing themselves were completely incapable of doing, right? And 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 Zheng Guofan was aware, aware, aware of the fact that the Qing was beginning to be afraid of him. He had about 100, whatever, 50,000 troops, so Simon, which is not a very big number by today's standard. But if you look at the Qing army, it's only about a million or even less than a million. And of course, the, the Xiangqing is a much more capable fighting force. Uh, in, but there is something that was very, very interesting where ideology came into play. Instead of Tordama and all these things, they, over, they have implemented regime change. When uh, Zheng Guofan realized that the Qing was afraid of his power, he actually gave up, dissolved the Xiang, Xiangjun a few months after the capital, capital of Nanjing. In exchange for probably a high level position in the government. And the only thing that, this is why Li Hongzhang became a problem. Li Hongzhang was from Anhui, the Huaijun was preserved. So to some degree, he was hoping Li Hongzhang would not get the same kind of jealousy or fear from the Qing. So Li Hongzhang became that very big, uh, important person in that, in that regard. Now, what I want to show you, because this had a very interesting uh, revelation afterward. So this is a graph that's showing for the next three decades, Hunan-based elites become quite prominent in national politics. Okay, And they have a disproportional share of elites. And this is where, where I think we are exploring now is a very different AD structure that this is surrounding Zheng Guofan is the main person. And if you read a lot of work, Zheng Guofan caused a very, very, you know, he didn't live very long, but he caused a very long shadow and covered some of the uh, Hunan elites, including some of the most outspoken. Guo, Guo Songtao is one of the, he's one of the most liberal minded uh, person, but living in Hunan where there's no, there's not even missionary, it's the most conservative place. But having you know these very strong ideas for reform, these the blue lines are the civil service examination links. So the civil service to teacher student relationship became very important, and those are the things you, you see very different in Japan, right? But that all became as in the centralized system. The the Hunan based elites were the major self strengthening movement and the reform, which is parallel to the major reform until they were defeated by the Meiji, right? So one of the things about the self-strengthening movement, the crucial element is they don't build the railroads, they don't, they don't change the fundamental institutions, okay? Because they have to do it under the imperial, there's no particular regime change. So we can do the similar kind of things to some degree to look at a different kind of AD structure and a power structure. And two, of course, this whole group and the Beiyang was defeated by Japan, right? That is the most, and the, you know, I think Li Hongzhan, we probably know, is the saddest, uh, whatever bureaucrat. Every time China was defeated, he got dragged out and and you know gets slapped around by everyone. And uh, but I, you know, I think Li Hongzhan was actually probably, if you read some of the things, he knows what was going on. But there's not much he could do if the imperial system didn't want to do it. Right. So they signed the Treaty of Shimonoseki, and and I was always telling you, look at the differences in, in the in the way they dress. Right. So uh, I'm not saying. It, so uh, then that's interesting because the Hunan network began to take on new directions 
And this is the story we want to then, if, you know, like the Satsumas, it was the people in Guangdong that had the first exposure of the West, right? So you can see these people, particularly Kang Youwei, Liang Qichao, and Huang, Huang Zhenxian, who is from Guangdong, but who is the first ambassador, Qing ambassador to Tokyo, he wrote the Urban Guozi. So that's the first comprehensive study of Meiji Japan. And it's very interesting, they all went to Hunan because I think Hunan was the political center to Sunni because the Hunan based elite Chen Bao, Chen Shiba, who's, who's the grand grandfather of Chen Yingchui. And, and so he's the governor. He began to give space. So remember, I think when I'm talking about Japan, Choshu or some places give space for reform, right? Particularly intellectual development. So I think in Hunan, the space was created for this intellectual development. And it was very interesting, all the Guangdong-based intellectuals, they were moving into Hunan and launched all these places. This story we know very well, this is Tan Sitong, right? This is the, the he is from Hunan, but the, you know, it's the intellectual uh, input is a lot of it coming from, and we all know what happened afterwards. So the, the, one of the things I want to say, you know, I didn't get to translate into English here, Liang Qichao himself, when they did 100 reform, they very, very carefully look at the Meiji success, right? They particularly mentioned the Satsuma and Choshu, and they actually made claim that Hunan should be independent, right? We all know the whole story of Hunan, you know, even if you read the Mao Zedong in 1920s, so Hunan should be independent. So the whole idea is that only with that kind of autonomy, you have a space for uh, change. So Hunan should be the Satsuma of that. Uh, there are all kinds of contradictions that come out of it. So um, we, I think the rest of the story is very, very clear. So there's constitutional reform that was, was going on. And we all know the 100-day reform was, was suppressed. But the constitutional reform really started. Okay. And this is sort of getting to the final line that I'm going to talk about is Internal reform was becoming harder precisely because the centralized bureaucratic structure. So what happened is these reforms eventually converged uh, in, in, in Japan. That's, you know, even Sun Tzu San himself went to Japan. This is again, uh, the work coming out of uh, James's chapter for the Cambridge volume. So these are the different organizations. The people studying, the students studying overseas Japan are much more likely to join these organizations of rebellion. Now, uh, Tokyo, we all know the story of Lu Xun, you know, those people uh, get their enlightenment and so on. But a lot of people, you know, didn't realize Sun Tzu San spent a long time in Tokyo. That's where he met Sun Qingling and whatever. The, um, he was in and out of Tokyo, Yokohama for a long time. But very crucially, you know, I think this is the book by, uh, I think it's called Provincial Patriots. This is the time he was introduced to Huang Xing. And Huang Xing was a Hunan. With, with the whole, and so it's the first time to that degree the overseas rebellion forces joined with the internal rebellion forces. Okay, that's why the Xinhai Revolution is, is leading to decentralization and and all these things. So I think I'm sort of getting to the end of it. So this is the story we are still looking for. And con conclusion is that conclusion. <laughs> we are, we're certainly lo looking to do a lot more work. Is the idea that. Um, the whole process of regime change is very important. I think we had a long conversation afterward. I think the problem is we judge the Xinhai Geming a little bit more harshly is because people think it was a failure. And um, if you look at the nature of the Xinhai Geming, it was actually quite successful in terms of its relatively peaceful transition, is relatively bloodless. There is a peaceful transfer of power. Um, now, what happened afterward was much trickier. But that also depends on the interpretation, right? You had whatever 15 years of parliamentary de democracy, uh, which only got suspended in 1924. And the warlord period, probably we should reinterpret as well. As I mentioned, some of the universities, some of the bad things were all set up in the warlord era. I think people thought it was very bad because it was very weak uh, internationally. Uh, to some degree, it was not particularly weak internationally. In the you know, now people talk about Gu Weijun, the great diplomat, you know, who actually fought for Chinese rights and so on. So I think it may be thinking about it was the thing that happened afterward that allowed make us rethink about 
After 1920, 19, you know, I was just commenting a paper by buying yesterday, right? You have the rise of communism. That things began to really uh, change in that regard. So anyway, so let me conclude very uh, quickly. So I guess I should probably have a conclusion for. So this is something very important that I want to get something ideologies that's somewhere between institutions and the culture. Um, I think what Japan demonstrated is you never know that the idea that, you know, collective culture didn't work. Uh, yes, yeah, some elements of collective culture didn't work, but when you had a proper change, you know, there could be change, it could be reform and so on. So this is something that's very, very important as implication for the rise, for the rise of the West, the great divergence. And we want to sort of bring a new insights into the whole West impact. Chinese response or Eastern response, we want to show this much more rigorous uh, element. I mean, there are a lot of things we should be doing. You know, let me probably just end by saying that. Um, one of the very common arguments people make when, as soon as I start is, oh, Japan was much smaller. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to looking at the case of Korea, Northern Vietnam, which had a similar kind of ideology, but centralized, but had no response at all. Thank you very much. Thank you all. <laughs>
uh, the China, the central government in China uh, was very much uh, financially uh, corrupt. I mean, uh, not just corrupt, but uh, <laughs> but actually broken. Um, yeah. And then that gave um, that started to give the provinces uh, so much uh, autonomy. Uh, so basically, the Qin Imperial Court uh, told all the provincial warlords and uh, that uh, they can go in whatever way. Uh, uh, you guys should modernize your army and so on. But financially, you have to find the resources yeah. on your own. Don't yeah. count on us. So as a result, <clears throat> by the late 19th century, then the provinces across China became very much uh, independent financially and also militarily speaking. And then there was another period, as you mentioned, the so-called warlords uh, period, of the 1910s and 1920s uh, made China uh, really not one country, and especially uh, our Hunanese uh, comrade uh, uh, Mao Zedong was calling for uh, the independence of Hunan, uh, of course, slightly later. But but what I want to say is that uh, from the uh, uh, middle of the 19th century to the uh, middle of the uh, 20th century, uh, China went through uh, uh, a lot of uh, long periods of uh, independent uh, provincial um, governments and so yeah. on. I mean, how was that different from yeah. Japan? Yeah. Huh? No, I think that was a point, actually, uh, you know, my uh, former student, Peter Spashi, uh, um, Wang Rui was here. We, we had a conversation earlier. Um, after the Taiping Rebellion, the governors, Han, Han Chinese government, there's also the ethnic issue, right? Gained far more independence. Fiscally, they're also, uh, much bigger. I think they are, the, <clears throat> because for a long time, the governorship or county magistrates were very unstable. They were rotated and there's very little, uh, connections with the, uh, local population and so on. That's why the self censorship movement were allowed to take place to some degree. That there's local industries that were that were built. I think one thing which which I want to emphasize here, and I, which I think you you know, the simple f things of a fundamental national nature just could not happen. For example, the adoption of certain legal system. The company law was only happened after nineteen o in nineteen o four. Railroads, which will require a lot more coordination, which will require a lot more capital. And with, which is coming from the private sector could not happen either. And, you know, without the, for example, you know, Hassan would know, without the modern company law, more, modern banks were very, would be very hard to set up in, in a sense. Yes, I agree. I think, but there is a limit to the kind of decentralization. The governors are still rotated. They're still appointed. That's very, very important. Uh, one thing that's very important was these Hans, those positions. The, the Han lords in Japan, they are hereditary. They pass on from the families. They have their own military. Uh, they, certainly they have their own revenue source and so on. I think, I agree it's a matter of degree, but I think the matter of degree is, is quite, uh, crucial. And that really came out in the warlord period where the debate was becoming much more fierce, um, which we, you know, probably get. I, I, I guess we can continue debate for a long time, but, but of course, uh, China, China was so big. At that time, I mean, even uh, with uh, the the, the uh, southeastern corner uh, of China, would, that would be large enough to have yeah to introduce whatever new systems. I mean, like Jiangsu, Zhejiang, and Shanghai, right? That would, together they would be more than big enough to uh, accommodate whatever possible experimentation and uh, and so on yeah. they they experimented but certain things just not possible for example mm -hmm. building railroads were dismantled uh mechanized yarn production uh that was very very clear it only got mm -hmm. started afterward so yeah yeah i mean just to sort of actually i wonder whether you can um i wonder whether you can maybe talk a bit more about this idea of ideology as maybe the ceiling that kind of makes certain things not possible. Because I'm thinking even forward to the warlord period. I mean, even during the high tide of warlordism, and then even during the Nanjing decade, now historians look more at the provinces, because that's actually where a lot of the state building happens. But all these warlords, they still want to have, in the end, you know, even like Anhui click, Jili click, they all want to go in the end to have a national capital and reunite China again. So it's not... Um, 
So I don't know whether, you know, even at the extreme in the warlord period, you know, let alone speak about the Qing, um, you know, the reason why uh, you know, Zheng Guofan and Li Hongzhang, they don't go to Beijing and take over or they, they build yeah. their own um, smaller state is there seems to be maybe ideologically some problem there that, you know, you can't make that last step. And that then, as you say, limits a lot of things that you can't experiment. You can't get rid, for, for example, of the civil service exams, which I think that's a huge deal. Right, right, yeah. right. So I wonder whether you can talk a bit more about yeah, ideology, yeah. even beyond the Qing, I suppose. Yeah. You know? No, that debate really went on. I think the, actually... One of the people I got the first ideas of is the work by Yang Xiaokai, who began to look into Chen Jun, Chen Junming, who was going against the Sun Zhong San. So the thing, even with the nationalists, their ideas unified China. They were based in Guangdong. The Beifa was very important, right? It's just like Ming Chao Beifa. I mean, the whole idea was modeled after the Ming dynasty. So Chen eventually got rid of Sun Zhong San because he said Guangdong is for the people of Guangdong. Why do we need to go and you know sacrifice local interest for the for the greater national? So I think that ideology was becoming extremely important. I mean, we you know it, it's also obviously very politically sensitive as well. I I do the only places where the was you know when you look at a, a, I worked a little bit on the international settlement in Shanghai. That was a place where people have no ideology of, of Daito, right? <laughs> this is a place that for local capitalists only. And they are interested in national, you know, capital investments. They want to create an environment that was good. But all the it was based on rep local representation system, right? We those people pay the taxes, we have a right to vote. So they 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 took all the things that were there. So, and of course, I think to some degree, we all know it was very successful, certainly for the Westerners, but also for the elite uh, business people as well. I, I, I think I completely agree with you. Were, were you, you know, that problem that I'm talking about did not go away. Certainly did not go away at all. I, even in the case of Japan, it did not go away. Japan, you know, the royal emperor eventually was turning into something much more, um, you know, nationalistic and so on. Yeah. No, I agree. I think it's a problem even today. It was only by accident. You know, Hong Kong is a great example. It was only by accident you have an area that cannot, that, that, that give up the ambition of unifying the whole state. Well, let's focus on our own people and, and do the own thing. Okay, let me take a, a couple of questions from the, the Zoom attendee, uh, attendees. Huh? Uh, from uh, Jacqueline uh, Veloz, uh, Velosco. Uh, Levin, can you see it? Yeah, I can screen? see it. Okay. Maybe uh, you can take her question. Was it a? So was it yeah, a, yeah. So I, I guess everybody could see it, right? Yeah. So um, now I. This is, of course, I, I'm not in any way denying the importance of agrarian conditions, all of that. But I, I'm just saying these conditions probably matter much less. It's the rapid policy change. Uh, both Japan and China depends on how you measure. It. I think there are people who really try to. Uh, uh, you know, extort the data and so on. There, but both Japan and China emerged in the eighteen seventies, eighteen eighties was about sixty, seventy percent uh, share of GDP in agriculture. And I don't, you know, productivity, labor productivity was very high. Sorry, labor productivity was not that high, but land productivity was very, very high. Uh, the idea, I mean, I, you know, this this goes back a long way. I I remember when I met a Chinese student who studied in Japan. <coughs> And he had a written book based on one single thesis. Uh, you know, one of the idea that you have a more productive economy, creating more agricultural surplus, which could be used to build industrialization, which I find that's less and less true. His thesis was that Japanese people overall eat much less rice, so they have more surplus for industrialization. And it was a, it was a, it was a thesis part. I, I don't find that as, as plausible. I think nowadays, it may be important for understanding the 18th century, but I think mid-19th century, that's what I try to uh, get, is this very rapid policy, same as, as you know, 1980s. I think, the, you know, the you know, advertising Cambridge Economic History volume, uh, a chapter by Barry Norton, uh, in late 1970s, China was maybe the half of the average of African economies. But other indicators were much higher. The human capital level was much higher. Life expectancy was better. 
So the catch-up potential was was huge in that regard. I think in the case, in this case, I think it was similar as well. I I don't think it's so much a question of agrarian stuff. So whether or not you can latch on to the reform and make a political economy change. Uh, of course, it's a it's a long process. So on. Okay. Uh, so the question from Judy. Uh, do I don't know. Other people AI, better. <laughs> AI, AI challenge. I I don't. <clears throat> I, I, I think that goes, again, you know, it used to be a time that Japan was considered the technological leader of the world. And, and I think nowadays, uh, uh, I think it's the political economy. Both countries are aging, right? But the political economy is the big questions uh, that we, we see here. China, in terms of the, of the talent, um, in terms of the, you know, scientists or even the universities, uh, they are not major constraints at all. And and it, and it, this is again a great example of culture, right? Japan's the country that adopted everything, translated. You know that when we didn't say that seventy percent of the modern Chinese Chinese characters were invented by the Japanese, so they are the for, forefront of of innovation. Um, it's not necessarily culture open, they, you know. But nowadays, I think things have completely reversed. Japan was becoming turning much more inward in, in contemporary sense, of course, still highly developed economy and so on. So that's what I try to get a little bit. It's not so much cultural attitude itself; it's the political economy, ideological side that was probably extremely important. So By the way, I think Wei Wen is here. I don't, I don't know if, uh, or maybe uh, if, if Zara is, is a feel free if you want to. Maybe not so much about AI, but I don't know. Maybe you know a lot more about AI. I don't know if Jara is online. Uh, so maybe uh, did you use uh, ChatGPT to prepare your slide? <laughs> well, I I I I only finished by late this morning, and uh, my course away was suggested I could do it for you with ChatGPT, but I, I haven't taken up that. Okay, so you cannot really comment. No, I can't AI. comment. On Let, let's ask Professor Lee. Uh, All right, I have um, maybe half comment. Half question. The comment is uh, one thing I really like about this talk uh, is this idea. I mean, I, I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit, which is when idea meets power, that means change. So the incidents you have is when Sun Zhongshan, which has the idea, meets Huang Xing, who has the power, essentially. We, we the see network, the change. Yeah. So, so a Cantonese need to help. Yes, exactly. So that's uh, that's the kind. <coughs> so so margin of people. Yeah, in this can... sense, that the idea and the power are synergy. You know? so that that's kind of the common. It, uh, the question, in a sense, it, you know, you can use this framework perhaps to see Japan to some extent. You can see that probably for Martin Luther to some extent also, right? Idea with you know, local power for that. So do you have some general theory about you know, in this sense about how institution design allows idea to meet power more rapidly yeah. for good or for bad. Well, a great example of Martin Luther was Martin Luther was protected by local German lord, right? So they gave him space. I think that's saying uh, that that is something very important. So what I try to argue here is is not why China Japanese ideology self couldn't create because they don't, they don't have the experiments of the entire European, you know, uh, Protestant Reformation, Renaissance, and all these experiments that have gone on that give them a lot of, you know, eventually leading to industrial revolution. China Japan completely missed all of that, right? By 19th century, you know, yeah, they had a Dutch study, but they, they tried to understand the body anatomy and all of that. So there was very little. So I don't think they can really get onto, but by mid 19th century, the entire knowledge set was there, right? Whether or not you are willing to take it is important. But who has access to the knowledge? In China, there's no shortage of people who understand that. But if those people couldn't find a base of power, that was not very useless. We, you know, there's a very good biographer called Wang Tao. You know, he's not going anywhere. I think Guo Sun Tao, I think it's a very detailed story about Guo Sun Tao in Hunan. That's extremely interesting. He started doing these schools and he was mocked and, you know, but he was almost assassinated by these conservatives. Uh, he's the most liberal, you know, open mind because he had first hand experience in London. You know, he's, he spent time with Yan Fu, who actually knows English and so on. So, but, but in Japan, that's quite interesting. It's not they're much more open minded, but there's some of these Satsuma Choshu people. They eventually, they only need to overthrow 
their Han leadership in the case of Choshu, like this Gaosan, he actually overthrew, he didn't have to go all the way to Tokyo, overthrew the Bakufu. Whereas I think in China, it's much more difficult because of the layers of control. I, so th this is, a, and this is why something that's uh, maybe the last point I want to in answer to, this is why it's very peculiar. The Chinese revolution was launched from abroad because there's no domestic space anymore. Once you're out of domestic space, the revolution actually tend to become much more violent, right? Because in, in the case of Japan, the Meiji restoration, it was bloody and violent, but eventually it was a peaceful transfer of power because it was basically Tuku, the Tukugawa family were never persecuted. They were basically made, you know, made to retire permanently. You know, actually, I met one of the Tukugawa family descendants. They all went into education because they were very, very well educated and so on. And, so. and the Tukugawa, the Shogun tombs were still there. So it was a, that was something very, very important, that relatively peaceful, precisely because there is a domestic space for that kind of rebellion. And the rebellion was not so costly. When it was not so costly, and I think it's much easier to achieve a peaceful transfer of power. I, I think uh, we are beyond uh, the scheduled time. So so I we should uh, stop here. Right. Um, so let's uh, thank Professor Ma again. Thank you very much for it. Um, we have a couple of other questions which I'll read after the, from yeah. the audience. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll read after. Don't, you know, we okay. don't have to answer okay. them. So yeah. I, I'll, thank I'll you. you. Thank you. And also thanks to uh, those of you uh, who have been uh, patient and, uh, and are still around uh, via Zoom. Okay. So we're going to hold more uh, quantitative history lectures uh, in thank the future. You. So stay tuned. Mm -hmm.